The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. There is one body and one spirit. There is one holy and God's call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One, one God and the Father of all. And together we pray, O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the proclamation of the Lord. Words. 
and God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the Spirit of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. Will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? The hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake you are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Living word of God. We'll join now in singing our gradual hymn, 569, the common phrase, Come by way of truth, my God.
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <coughs> you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. The Gospel of Christ. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeeming. Amen. Have you understood all this? Let me tell you, somebody's lying. <laughs> Is there anything any more confusing than those parables that Jesus puts there this morning? Little short snippets. Little short snippets. And when he's done and he says, have you understood all of this? And the disciples said, yes. Pity they hadn't said no. Because then maybe he would have explained it more. Because these passages are cryptic messages. They're cryptic about what the kingdom is about. They're cryptic about what you can expect. They have beautiful images, they have an overload of active characters, there's all sorts of things going on in these messages. But let's be honest, do any of us really know what they're trying to tell us? You're all going to say yes, we all know. <laughs> How many of you know exactly what those parables are saying? I'm not putting my hand up because I have no idea. I've read scholar after scholar this week, and they all had different and different ideas about what it is. Because what we have are mustard seeds, we have a sourdough starter, we have hidden treasures, we have expensive pearls, we have nets thrown into the sea, and we have fish that are separated into baskets, keeping what is good and throwing out what is bad, which certainly seems all to make great sense. But when we try to make that into the kingdom of heaven, we're going to ask ourselves, have I understood all of this? And if I'm honest, which I'm going to be brutally honest with you, no, I didn't understand all of this. And if someone in that group had been a little more honest, maybe it would have been explained a little better for all of us. But as it is, we're left trying to figure it out. But let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is not like. Let's start there, what it's not like. It's not spending a lifetime accumulating stuff that in the end somebody puts in a yard sale because they don't want it. <laughs> you know, mom's china, grandma's crystal. That's not the stuff the kingdom of heaven is about. It's not like our sea, the life being choked with plastic or our drinking water being filled with microplastic particles. The kingdom of heaven is not like that. It is not like our brothers and sisters who because of their color or their religiosity or their culture fear to walk down the street or go to the store or stay quietly at home for fear of what is outside said door. The kingdom of heaven is not like. And you can fill in the blank of what you think it is not like for you. The kingdom of heaven is not filled with people who are homeless, who are lost, who are searching for loved ones and wondering if they're over in the landfill. The kingdom of heaven is not, and we can go on. And if I went around this church today and asked every single person here, everyone would have an answer to fill in of what the kingdom of heaven is not. And so while we can figure out what it is not, we have trouble figuring out what it is. 
because we have cryptic messages. I know one time in the Bible study, someone said they really liked it that I didn't come to the Bible study with the answers. <laughs> and I'm there thinking, God, I don't even know what the questions are anymore. <laughs> Never mind trying to fool you into thinking I have the answers. But if biblical scholars, well-learned biblical scholars, people who have put years of research into these particular sayings, if they can't pin down exactly what the meaning is, then what does that say to the rest of us? It says that we're going to continue to struggle with this. And maybe that was Jesus' whole point, that we would struggle with what exactly the kingdom of heaven is. Because if he laid it out for us, what the kingdom of heaven is, and what exactly God's expectations of us are, then would we need God anymore? Because, of course, we, human beings being what we are, we would consider ourselves little demigods. And thanks very much, God, but I got it. I know the answer. So hold on up there, because I can take care of it. And we move into that kind of mindset, because that's just the way we are as human beings. We want to take over. We want to take over. And when we realize that, hang on a second, we don't have all the answers, we don't know what all the answers are, maybe there's a greater power at work here that we might need to defer to from time to time from our human assuredness. Then we realize that maybe there is something more in this cosmic realm that is bigger and more powerful than we human beings are. And if God has not, through Jesus, given us all the answers about what the kingdom is like, then it requires us to use our own imagination. Fancy that. Because when you put your imagination to use on these parables, it gets a whole new light. You ever been stuck in a car or stuck somewhere with a little child who's growing more and more bored with what's going on around them and you need to entertain them? And so one of the ways you can entertain them is to build a story. And so you start. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess who lived in a lovely tower and we say, now it's your turn. And the child takes over, and the princess could fly and had gorgeous wings, and they were glittery like a butterfly. Do we ask why she had wings and they were glittery like a butterfly? It doesn't matter. It's a story. It's the creativity. It's the imagination that's engaged, and things don't have to make sense. The story doesn't have to flow and work like it would in human life because it's a story, it's a once upon a time, it's a parable, and it can be whatever you want it to be. And when we see that imagination and that creativity engaged, there's no explanation required. And what about if the kingdom is like that? No explanation is required. We're not required to understand every nitty-gritty little detail. We are merely required to believe. How about that? Then the pressure comes off of us to be able to explain all of these parables that are cryptic messages that we really don't understand but we don't really want to admit to our congregation we don't know the answer to. Because we want to make it relevant. We want to make it work. We want you to think we know what we're talking about. I'm telling you, I have no idea. I have no idea what these parables really meant. I do know what the kingdom of heaven is not, just like you know what the kingdom of heaven is not. But when it comes to what it is actually like and how God is at work in that kingdom, Jesus never tells us. He never lays it out for us. And he leaves it to our imagination to figure it out because we're supposed to be building a relationship with God and we're supposed to be building a relationship with each other. And in there somewhere, we're supposed to be able to find what the kingdom is like. It is like a relationship with God. It is like a relationship with each other. And if our relationship with each other reflects our relationship with God, how well are we doing How well are we doing in our relationships with each other? Because that's a reflection of God. Then it gets a little scary, especially if you had an argument this week with somebody you don't particularly like. And then you're thinking, oh my God. (laughs) I had an argument with somebody who's a reflection of God. 
But when we put away that need, when we put away that need for an explanation, when we put away the need for the certainty of what the answer is, when we stop trying to have all of the answers ourselves, then we open up our own imaginations, just like we did in story time with the little children in the once upon a time. We have wonder, we have curiosity, we have creativity, we have all. And that lies at the very heart of the kingdom. And that's where we witness God's work. That's where we witness God's work in the creativity and the imagination. And that's where we make room for God to work in and through each of us. In the all, in the imagination, in the lack of answers, and in our willingness to be open, in our willingness to be open to whatever the possibilities might be. So if in these unresolved, confusing stories, we still seek to find something Jesus shows us that what we seek is right there within each of us, in our own creativity and in our own imaginations, in our own willingness to ask questions and in our own willingness to be playful with the answers. The kingdom is for dreamers and visionaries who are not limited by the certainties that sometimes we try to place there as an institution. It's for people who can catch a glimpse of the world that God is at work and can paint a picture from that alone. Have you understood all of this? No? Well, then there's hope for all of us yet. Because that means we're going to keep an open mind we're going to keep open to questions. We're going to keep open to playfulness and open to creativity. And we will find the answers in and amongst ourselves, in relationship with one another, and with knowing that God is at work in the world. If the disciples have probably been slightly more honest on that particular occasion when Jesus said to them, have you understood all of this? At least one of them would have said no. To be honest, we haven't understood it. And perhaps the best thing is that we never will, because then that keeps us open, it keeps us creative, and it keeps our imagination limitless to what the kingdom of God can be, instead of looking at what it is simply not. Because the kingdom of God holds vast possibilities, it holds huge promises, and it reminds each of us that we all have a place, and it means something different for every single one. Have we understood those parables this morning? No. And in which case, I've done a good job this morning, because I have no intentions of explaining them. Amen. <laughs> now then, we're going to continue in our service with the presentation and the examination of this will. <laughs> Who's coming for baptism this morning? So, if the parents and godparents would like to come, I would, unless you're going to have an eye to the screen, how to be able to see the answers and the other things. Moving closer, put your minds ready like a candle. Like magic. <laughs> <laughs> it's so 
presentation.
Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Will you strive to safeguard the integrity of God's creation and respect, sustain, and renew the life of the earth? Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon Willow the forgiveness of sin and have raised her to the new life of grace. Sustain her, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit, and give her an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Close as you usually are, peace. <laughs> Let's 
God delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, our Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of a new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell in all your sons. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever.
Glory to God, whose power working in us can be infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who walks on wounded feet, walk with you to the end of your room. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who serves with wounded hands, help you to serve one another. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who loves with a wounded heart, be your love forever. Look for the face of our Lord Jesus Christ in everyone that you meet, and may they see his face in you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer, be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Do we have any announcements? Do we have an announcement? I have one that I forgot to put in to the uh, mail chip this week. One email that you all know. Um, back to school. As you know, every year for September, Biddy has a back to school box that comes out and we pick up the school supplies and it goes out to Lady McNamara School, which is in the inner city. So, you have all of August to pick up school supplies, backpacks, pencils, pens, crayons, exercise books, notebooks, all of those sorts of things. Everything that children need when they go back to school. The box will be out. Um, you can drop it off during the regular office hours, which are on Thursday mornings. Or you can save it all up and bring it for that first Sunday in September when we go do the blessing of everything for the back to school so that... Laura and Bob, who's here today, um, they usually deliver it on Biddy's behalf. Um, so we want to get that collected up. Um, so please make sure you remember in your shopping sprees uh, or your excursions to pick up a few extra items so that we can put it in that box and make sure that the children in that inner city school will have all the supplies that they need. Backpacks and So <clears throat> That's the only thing that I think I forgot when I went to the <laughs> We just wanted to welcome everybody uh, after the service in the church hall for some cake and refreshments. There's tea, coffee, all kinds of things. So, parishioners, family, please join us in the hall. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa Cameron, and I'm Doug and I are helping uh, Shelby with the garage sale. Um, our garage sale is on September 9th, which is a Saturday. Most of you may know that. Um, the setup will be on Friday, September 8th. We've been asking you to bring items to the church. Today is the last Sunday. You can bring it on Sundays because we will be at Fort Care United. But September 3rd, our first Sunday back here, please bring your items. And if you have heavy items or larger items, um, if you could bring them on the 8th. I don't know the timing yet of when we're setting up. I think we're doing a lot during the day, but I think we'll be receiving items in the evening. So if you have larger items, please bring them on the 8th. If not, bring stuff on the 3rd. Thank you. I just want to welcome and thank Dina for joining us today and meeting.